These are our measured data, the top two sets of parameters. The effective diffusion coefficient for deuterium for both materials was 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10 meters squared per second. The effective porosity came out to be the exact same as the total porosity, which we were expecting anyways. Uh, we were comforted to know that we did measure it and it did come out the same. And what we did is we used this one-dimensional model with these input parameters and we allowed ourselves the luxury of adjusting the velocity in this profile and then looking at the, the, the time to develop the diffusion profile and compare them, the, the resulting diffusion profile to the measured data to obtain an estimate of one, velocity, and timing of till deposition and timing of the onset of the Holocene. Let me explain. These are our data across this interface. This, is, this to me is the most interesting part of, of the conservative transport. Uh, if we look at our initial conditions for this modeling venture, this is what we assumed. We assumed constant conditions in the clay aquitard, which, is, which seem reasonable. Our assumption for constant conditions, or constant delta deuterium, at time of deposition of the till, in the till, is based on the fact that this, this till was deposited as part of a temperate glacier. As being a temperate glacier, it is wet throughout, so one would expect water to be fairly consistent throughout it, and it's also confirmed by pre-consolidation data that we've collected throughout the entire profile. So that's our assumption. What does our best fit look like? Our best fit is shown here. And we've, we've had a number of other simulations, but I'm just going to present the best fit data. And it, it was obtained for a velocity of between 0.75 and 1 meter per 10,000 years. For transit time, or a transport time, of between 20,000 and 30,000 years. The profiling, the modeling is very sensitive to velocity even though, as you can see, the shape of this mixing profile is the result, is dominated by a diffusive process. Why is, velocity, why is this modeling sensitive to velocity? Well, because diffusion is upward across this interface and advection is downward. Okay, they're, 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 they're fighting against each other. So it proved to be very sensitive. So what does this say? What does this good fit say about, first of all, the deposition of till? Well, Previously, this till was, we said this till was younger than 30,000 years. Our best estimate based on these data indicates that the till was deposited between 20 and 30,000 years ago. Fort fortuitously for us, I think, not fortuitously, it turned out very well because subsequently we've done carbon-14 age dating on, on DIC at that glaciogenic water, that minus 178 delta deuterium, and the carbon-14 numbers age dates range from 25,000 to 31,000 years BP. They fit very nicely. So we get a good estimate of till deposition, and we also get a good estimate of the advective velocity in these materials. And the fact that the advective velocity we calculate here is, is virtually identical to the advective velocity we calculate with hydraulics is very comforting as well, because it gives an idea of long-term advective velocity through the system. It also sheds some light on the fact that many people have said that there is a lower threshold, there's a threshold gradient in aquitards below which groundwater doesn't flow. That threshold gradient was previously believed by some to be, it's a point of contention anyways, previously believed to be somewhat higher than the velocity that we're measuring. So these data suggest that if there is a threshold gradient, it's much lower than some people believe it to be. We do the same thing in the, in the upper profile. So this is the upper profile, the Holocene, the prof profile that developed during the Holocene. The back, initial background conditions were minus 178. The input was, was, was turned on at deglaciation, de de excuse me, and for lack of data, we had to assume that it occurred at the contact between oxidized and the unoxidized till. So that's our initial conditions, and we allowed the system to run and there's our best fit simulations with the same velocities that we obtain at depth below. And the timing of this is between 7 and, and 10,000 years transit time. That's how long it took to develop this. And that, that information is in keeping with, there's, this, there's a, quite a bit of information on the onset of the Holocene in the area that I work, and it fits very well with the onset of the Holocene. So it confirms the onset of the Holocene. So where do we stand with our conservative tracers? Well, conservative tracers show that diffusion is a dominant process. We can estimate 
advective velocity or long-term advective velocity from these data, we can, we can get a fairly accurate estimate, as accurate as we think we can get, on the, the timing for till deposition in this area. And we can also get a confirmation of the onset of the Holocene. So with that said, now let's turn to reactive transport, or what we conceived or perceived as reactive transport. And we did this on the upper 50 meter profile. We, just, we dealt with this Holocene profile. We didn't deal with a more interesting profile at depth because we started to, and I don't think we have enough data yet to interpret that lower profile, which in our estimation is probably more interesting than the one I'll present here. So how we approach that? Well, we'll, well first of all, I'll characterize the constraints in the system. The, you know, the, the mineralogical constraints and the environmental conditions in the pour, that the pore water in, this aqua, in the tail aquitard sees. Then I'll go on and describe the distribution of the major ions. We'll only deal with major ions in this presentation throughout that depth. And then we'll do some transport modeling and some geochemical simulations to see what could happen or how the chemistry of these major ions could have changed with, with transit time through the upper part of the tail aquitard. Well, the water in, these till, in, the, in the till is in contact. I'll just remind you of this. The water in the till is, has, is in contact, has been in contact with a matrix material for a considerable period of time. As seen here, there are reactive minerals present in that till. So you give it long enough contact time, and if the conditions are right, one should see a change in the aqueous geochemistry of the pore water. As far as environmental conditions go, I'll present two sets of environmental conditions here. The third set, the redox conditions, I'll save for about five or six overheads from now. As far as pH goes, pH decreases with depth. It starts off at about 7.9 in the oxidized zone and drops off to 7.3 at depth in the glaciogenic water area. As far as temperature goes, the temperature below seven meters in, in these aquitards is between 5.3 and 5.6 degrees centigrade. The upper seven meters show seasonal fluctuations, and those are exhibited, those are presented by the solid lines, which are the result of max mins from thermocouples that are installed down to seven meters every 30 centimeters and have been monitored for about three years by us. So you can see the temperature fluctuations up above, and you can see the pH. Now, how does a pore water chemistry look in this? Now, Again, we're going to deal with the major ions. Up on the left-hand panel, we'll start with total dissolved solids. And you can see that the total dissolved solids decrease from high concentrations in the oxidized zone. The cause of that is, as I've explained, because we have high sodium, magnesium, sulfate water as a result of the oxidation during the Holocene period. High concentrations up there, and the concentrations decrease the background values at depth. And they seem to reach background values at about 15 meters below ground surface. Now, one could take the units off of that TDS profile and change, and change the, the logo on top of it to sodium, magnesium, potassium, or sulfate, and get the same profile. So what I'm describing for TDS also applies to these other ions. Slightly different, however, is the alkalinity profile, the middle profile. It decreases with depth as well. There's a little more error in the numbers. Uh, those, are, those are multiple sets of analyses. Uh, they seem to come to background at possibly about 20 meters below ground surface. Trend is somewhat similar. In contrast, you look at the calcium ions. The calcium ions show the opposite trend. They start low, go higher with depth. The first thing that, that crossed my mind when I looked at these data was that there doesn't appear to be a lot going on. One, I was expecting sulfate reduction. If sulfate reduction was occurring, I would expect to see different sulfate profiles. I don't see that. The sulfate tracks the sodium very nicely and the magnesium. Uh, I do regression analyses. I do regression analyses between the, the TDS and the data that it represents, and I come to R squares of 0.99 to 1. I compare these data to these other two sets of data, and I get much poorer regressions. If I compare these data to these data to the carbon-13 DIC data, which I haven't presented, what I end up getting is very strong correlations, greater than 0.9. So even though these data look similar, except for the calcium ion, and even though they look similar, there, there are subtle differences between them. And I'll come back to those subtle differences later. But the one thing I'd like to 
step into now is the sulfate. Why is there no sulfate reduction occurring in this system with depth? Because again, we're